maybe this one. Yeah, maybe we can. You should ask uh, the technical people. This one is for. Yeah, it's for this. Yeah, for headphones. I don't know why you can. Yeah, but without this, uh, oh, I shout. Uh, attention, please. Attention, attention. Can you try? Attention, please. Uh, no? That's it? Я прошу всіх розсаджитись на місця, будемо розпочинати. Good morning, everyone. I am uh, not sure if uh, you can hear me, but apparently the, um, the headphones are working. So uh, I'm very happy to uh, moderate this panel on the transition to auction system of uh, renewable energy support, uh, where we will see some practical experience from other countries and uh, from experts. And uh, so, without further ado, I would uh, like to introduce you to Ozaf uh, Makanov, uh, manager from the Kazakhstan uh, Electricity Grid Operation Company. So, Makanov, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Me uh, уважаемые коллеги, здравствуйте. Очень приятно присутствовать на данном мероприятии. Хотелось бы рассказать немного о, о, о аукционах в Республике Казахстан. Переход зеленой энергетики – это тренд мировой экономики. Казахстан поставил перед собой амбициозную, амбициозную задачу по переходу к зеленой генерации и наращиванию ее доли в структуре генерирующих мощностей. Согласно концепции по переходу Республики Казахстан к зеленой экономике, Доля ВИА к 2020 году планируется в размере 3% в общем объеме производства электроэнергии. К 2030 году 10%, а к 2050 году 50% с учетом альтернативной энергетики. Достижение поставленной задачи базируется на имеющемся ресурсном потенциале ВИА в Казахстане. Имеющийся потенциал ветровой энергии – оценивается в 920 миллиардов киловатт-часов в год. Солнечной энергетики – 3000 солнечных часов в год и гидроэнергетики – в 62 миллиарда киловатт-часов в год. В 2009 году, ну, немножко в историю, хочу сказать, что в 2009 году в Казахстане были приняты первые законодательные инициативы по поддержке развития сектора ВИА. В 2013 году был запущен механизм государственной поддержки сектора ВИА, который был основан на централизованной и гарантированной покупке всей электрической энергии, производимой ВИА. Данный механизм до 2018 года был основан на применении практики фиксированных тарифов. Введение фиксированных тарифов было необходимой мерой для становления самого сектора возобновляемой энергетики в Казахстане, привлечение в отрасли инвестиций и служило гарантией возврата вложенных финансовых ресурсов в реализацию проектов ВИА в Казахстане. Нужно отметить, что за все время действия механизма фиксированных тарифов удалось достичь 1% установленной мощности объектов ВИА в энергобалансе страны. Генерация электрической энергии объектами ВИА составила в 2018 году порядка 
1 миллиарда киловатт-часов электрической энергии. А для достижения данных целевых показателей государством для инвесторов в ВИА были предоставлены беспрецедентные меры поддержки, а именно гарантированные договоры покупки электроэнергии на 15 лет с расчетным финансовым центром ВИА, то есть долгосрочный договор ППА. Хотелось бы немного разъяснить, что такое расчетный финансовый центр. Данная компания является дочкой казахстанского оператора рынка всей электроэнергии, системного оператора ОКИГОК. То есть мы входим в квазигосударственный сектор. Расчетный финансовый центр был создан как раз таки для поддержки возобновляемой энергетики. И все заключенные договоры, то есть все договоры с ВИА заключаются с расчетным финансовым центром. И расчетный финансовый центр гарантирует 15-летнюю покупку всей электрической энергии, произведимой в ВИА. И также целевыми показателями государства в поддержке ВИА ну, является приоритетная диспетчеризация всего произведенного объема электроэнергии, освобождение от оплаты услуг за организацию балансирования, освобождение от оплаты услуг за передачу электроэнергии, а также инвестиционные преференции. Таким образом, результатом практического применения указанных мер поддержки является успешный ввод в эксплуатацию таких крупных электростанций, как то первая ветровая электростанция мощностью 45 мегаватт, то ветроэнерготехнологии 53 мегаватта, бурная солар 100 мегаватт, то СС Сарань 100 мегаватт и Коринская ГЭС 28,5 мегаватт. Применение такой государственной политики стало во многом решающим фактором перехода к механизму аукционных торгов по отбору проектов ВИА, поскольку именно такой механизм, используемый во многих странах мира, позволяет создать конкурентное поле, снизить цены и отобрать наиболее эффективные проекты. Хочется сказать, отметить, что Казахстан решил ну, отойти от практики фиксированных тарифов в связи с тем, что это как бы дорогостоящая вообще сама по себе вещь. И перейти к общему мировому тренду по воду аукционных торгов. Хочется отметить, что мы не создавали новую какую-то площадку для проведения аукционных торгов, поскольку в Казахстане также действует АО КРМ, акционерное общество КРМ, тоже является членом или субъектом квази, квазигосударственного сектора которая является оператором, казахстанским оператором рынка электрической энергии и мощности, и который занимается проведением спот-торгов электрической энергии и также просто купли-продажи электрической энергии на торговой площадке электронной. И на базе имеющихся мощностей как бы, была создана новая площадка по проведению аукционных торгов и таким образом в целях формирования объективных рыночных цен и создания полноценного конкурентного поля именно в аукционных торгах было определено, что Министерство энергетики устанавливает график проведения аукционных торгов на календарный год, в котором указываются основные параметры торгов. Это стартовая аукционная цена, тип технологий, требуемый объем установленной мощности, величина проектов малые или крупные, то есть малые это до 10 мегаватт, крупные свыше 10 мегаватт. Также расположение объекта возобновляемой энергетики, даты и время проведения торгов. Данные, размещенные в графике, не подлежат изменению, что создает определенность для всех участников. Проведение аукционных торгов раздельно по малым и крупным проектам, это было сделано для создания условий работы в отрасли как известным зарубежным инвесторам, так и для казахстанских инвесторов, которые пока не имеют большого опыта в реализации проектов ВИА. Хочется также отметить, что аукционные торги у нас прошли только в прошлом году. Это были первые наши пилотные аукционные торги. Они были разделены на две сессии, весенние и осенние. Это было сделано для того, чтобы между сессиями была возможность отработать предложения и замечания, которые могли поступать от участников рынка при проведении аукционных торгов. Также в результате проведения первой серии аукционных торгов рынок получил ценовые сигналы, 
на которые смогли ориентироваться инвесторы при подготовке к участию в осенней сессии серии аукционных торгов. В правилах проведения аукционных торгов установлены стандартные квалификационные требования для всех участников рынка, то есть юридическое соответствие. Данные требования позволяют принимать участие в аукционных торгах как казахстанским, так и зарубежным инвесторам на равных условиях. В целях, в целях отбора компаний, которые имеют финансовую возможность реализации проекта, предусмотрена необходимость внесения финансового обеспечения заявки на участие в аукционных торгах для всех участников в размере 2000 тенге киловатт-час, но в долларах это 5,3 доллара от установленной мощности проектов. Данное финансовое обеспечение в виде банковской гарантии или резервного кредитива должно быть предоставлено участникам аукционных торгов в установленные сроки на имя расчетного финансового центра. Я вибачаюсь, зараз мають призапустити систему, бо щось дуже погано чути, буквально хвилинку і продовжимо, добре? Зараз призапустять систему, тому дві хвилинки буквально. Окей. Все, да, да? Может, надо погромче поставить ближе. А, так, аукцион... а, что, в системе, а, что исключает вмешательство в ход проведения торгов человеческого ресурса и обеспечивает транспарентность и прозрачность проведения аукционных торгов. А, в целях определения победителей аукционных торгов и аукционных цен было решено применить односторонний аукцион. Стартовая цена была задана Министерством энергетики по типам ВИЭ. Участникам аукционных торгов запрещалось подавать заявки выше стартовой аукционной цены. Победители аукционных торгов объявлены по наименьшим предложенным ценам. Нужно отметить, что при подготовке проведения аукционных торгов участникам были предложены свободные земельные участки и точки подключения к ним для реализации проектов ВИЭ. Ввиду того, что технически имеются ограничения по подключению к электрическим сетям, имеющиеся ограничения были вшиты в программное обеспечение и учитывались при расчете аукционных цен. Необходимо отметить, что в цели создания конкурентного поля правилами аукционных торгов предусмотрены были высокие требования к уровню конкуренции при отборе проекта ВИА. Но таким образом, вот, это наличие не менее двух участников и при уровне обеспечения спроса на, на уровне менее 130% от объема, предложенного к аукционным торгам. По итогам аукционных торгов победители подписывают договор на покупку электрической энергии с ТО «Расчетный финансовый центр», то есть договора PPA, условиями которого гарантируется покупка всей вырабатываемой электрической энергии в течение 15 лет с момента ввода в эксплуатацию объекта ВИА по аукционной цене с ежегодной индексацией тарифа после года эксплуатации станции. При подписании договора покупки победитель должен предоставить расчетно финансовому центру финансовое обеспечение исполнения условий договора в размере 10 тысяч тенге за киловатт. Это примерно 26,5 долларов за киловатт установленной мощности проекта, что служит 
страхованием обязательств реализации проекта в установленные сроки. Если по каким-либо причинам победитель аукционных торгов не построит станцию в срок, он потеряет финансовое обеспечение. При, при этом эти денежные средства поступают в резервный фонд, созданный при РФЦ. В целях нивелирования рисков неплатежей для РФЦ создан резервный фонд, в котором аккумулируется 3% от годового оборота сектора ВИА, что обеспечивает надежность платежей инвесторам. В целях развития сектора ВИА в Казахстане инвесторам гарантируется покупка всей вырабатываемой электрической энергии в течение 15 лет по аукционным ценам, ежегодная индексация тарифов, приоритетная диспетчеризация объекта ВИА и освобождение от оплаты услуг энергопередающих компаний. Так, теперь хотелось бы остановиться немного подробнее на самих аукционах, которые были проведены в 2018 году. Итак, в феврале 2018 года Казахстану были анонсированы проведение первых аукционных торгов, направленных на отбор проектов ВИИ в объеме 1000 мегаватт установленной мощности, что соответствует практически 5% установленной мощности в Казахстане. Исходя из принятой архитектуры аукционных торгов, было принято решение проводить отбор проектов раздельно по типам станций. Это солнечные, ветровые, гидро- и биостанции. С учетом расположения их на территории Казахстана, что обусловлено имеющейся топологией электрических сетей и ресурсами возобновляемой энергетики. Так, согласно графике аукционных торгов, утвержденного полномочным органом, в прошлом году... В ходе проведения аукционных торгов инвесторам было предложено разыграть 1000 мегаватт с разбивкой по типам электростанций. Для солнечной станции это 290 мегаватт, ветровых 620 мегаватт, гидроэлектростанций 75 мегаватт и биостанций 15 мегаватт. Пилотные, пилотные аукционные торги 2018 года... Пилотные аукционные торги 2018 года были разделены... В ходе проведения аукционных торгов 2018 года было отобрано 36 проектов ВИА общей установленной мощностью 857,93 МВт. Из них ВЭС 500 МВт, СС 270 МВт, Малый ГЭС 82 МВт и БИО 5 МВт. Участие в аукционных торгах приняли 113 казахстанских компаний из 9 зарубежных стран то есть казахстанских и зарубежных компаний. География аукциона была представлена девятью странами мира. Это Казахстан, Россия, Китай, Турция, Франция, Болгария, Эмираты, Италия, Нидерланды. Суммарный объем заявок, поступивших от участников аукционных торгов, составил 3422 мегаватта. То есть объем спроса превысил объем предложения в 3-4 раза. Победители аукционных торгов закрыли 85% предложенной к аукционной мощности. По проектам Биостанции ГЭС и ВЭС объем спроса превысил объем предложения примерно в два раза. Наибольший интерес среди участников аукционных торгов был к реализации проектов солнечных электростанций, по которым объем спроса превысил объем предложения в семь раз. В результате проведения аукционных торгов максимальное снижение аукционной цены по ветровой генерации составило 23,3%. Стартовая цена по ветровой генерации составила 22,68 тенге киловатт-час. Ну, это примерно 0,06 доллара. По солнечной генерации 48%, по проектам малых ГЭС 23,4% и БИО на 1%. Что является очень хорошим результатом, подтверждающим, что создание конкурентного поля – позволило определить рыночные цены на электрическую энергию, генерируемую возобновляемыми источниками энергии. У меня все. Спасибо. Thank you, Mr. Makanov. Thank you for your interesting presentation. Now, if there is anyone in the floor that wants to make one question, otherwise we are going to pass to the next presenter.
Доброго дня, Мартинюк Олександр, Міненергове Вілля. Ну, перейду на русский. Спасибо, Ольжас, за очень интересную презентацию. На самом деле, мы изучали казахский опыт, и нам очень важно. У нас похожая ситуация, тоже большая страна, та же топология сети. Вопросов, на самом деле, много. Ну, скажем, все-таки это были пилоты, да? Пилоты, созданные в том числе для того, чтобы определить, ну, какие риски, существует, что нужно улучшить по результатам пилота. Какие вы планируете внести изменения в вашу аукционную модель? Так, какие изменения? Да, необходимо отметить, что при первой сессии, по весенней сессии 2018 года, были получены определенные результаты, были сделаны определенные выводы и были внесены изменения в законодательство. Если, например, победители весенних аукционов, они при, при, ну, при победе на аукционе они приходили в РФЦ, то они должны были предоставить банковскую гарантию на, то есть на исполнение условий договора до того, как заключат договор. Соответственно, это было в какой-то какой степени проблемой, поскольку договора еще не было, но РФЦ уже требовала гарантию. Для банков это не совсем приемлемо, поскольку им нужен договор для того, чтобы они под этот договор могли дать какую-то банковскую гарантию. Соответственно, нами были сделаны определенные выводы и было изменение. То есть теперь уже победители осенних аукционов, когда они пришли в РФЦ, они заключили договор и мы им предоставили 30-дневный срок для того, чтобы они предоставили банковскую гарантию. То есть сначала был заключен договор, а потом они должны были предоставить. Соответственно, они уже брали договор готовый, шли с ним в банк, и банк уже без проблем давал банковскую гарантию. Ну, как бы вот это вот основное изменение, ну, как им скидку, то, что уже вспомнил. Как бы. Я обучаюсь по одному питанию, дуже мало часу. Я також хотел бы задать питание. Вы понимаете украинский или лучше на российский? Если честно, не очень. Да. Маль, маленький вопрос. Вот мы услышали, что у вас 15 лет поддержка э, дается за результатами аукциона. Достаточно ли этого срока? Потому что я когда встречался в Ирене с вашим руководителем департамента возобновленной энергетики, она говорила, что все-таки лучше 20 лет, чем 15. Прокомментируйте, пожалуйста. Лучше 20, чем 15. А, ну, пока еще рано что-то комментировать. На самом деле, ну, это срок... Первоначально это, это тоже были первые договоры, это наша инициатива была первая. Как она дальше пойдет, на сколько лет это будет длиться, пока еще сложно сказать. Ну, я думаю, 15-летний срок, ну, поскольку люди, то есть компании смело приходят на рынок ВИА, смело участвуют в аукционах, их, видимо, это устраивает. Ну, пока так. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you for addressing the questions. Now we are moving to the second uh, speaker, which is uh, I'm very excited to introduce. Uh, Dr. Fell is uh, um, from the Energy Watch Group, but most importantly, has been member of the German Parliament between 1998 and, and 2013, and is one of the most uh, important policymakers uh, regarding uh, the support for renewable energy. Germany was the country to look at uh, when we were discussing about uh, supporting schemes. So I'm very excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Mr. Bianco, for your kind introduction. It is a pleasure for me to stay with you here again in this room. And I was often here to discuss with your parliamentarians and governmental boards these issues, how to come to renewable energies. And the today's discussion over auctioning and feed-in tariff is indeed very decisive. And you see in the headlines what I already highlight, our experience in Germany is completely otherwise than what we heard until today from EBID or others. The switch to auctioning is limiting the investment and it does not lead to cheaper cost. We have the clear experience now in Germany 
where we switch to it, and I want to tell you and show it to you in the details. First, I want to congratulate Ukraine to go this way to renewable energy. Best would be the target 100% renewable energies for Ukraine. This is the most decisive part for political independence through energy independence. You know what this means and how important it is. It is a contribution to peace. It will stimulate an economic growth and new jobs, but only with the best political instruments and to democratic development as well and the decisive, most decisive contribution to climate um, goals from Paris agreements. To understand why the switch from feed-in tariff to auctioning is more a hindering for renewable growth is to understand from Germany experience who were the actors who made this positive example reali reality. You know, we had 6% share of renewable in electricity in 2000, and with a fit-in tariff, we could rise it to 40%. Nearly no one believed it 20 years ago. It could be possible, but it is reality. And the investors, you see them here. Oh, it is not... Oh, light enough. But you see, most investment come from small and medium enterprises. Individuals, farmers, small commercials, project developers, funds and banks. Only 5% of all this huge investment in Germany came from the big utilities, from the four big utilities. And this is important to know when you have here's the advice with good uh, conditions to auctioning from EBID and others. They have only experience with the big utilities and not with the decentralized investors. EBID not even financed any project from any householders, from any farmers or others. And this is important to learn and to know. And the discussion between auctioning and feed-in tariff is an old discussion. We have it already since 20 decades in our German parliament. We decided for feed-in tariff, despite of the advice of plenty others who told us go to auctioning, and we were right. Look to the comparison what in wind power happened in the last year since 2000. Germany has an huge investment into wind power and less fit-in tariffs compared with Great Britain who used auctioning. They had higher prices and much less investment despite of Great Britain has much more wind than Germany and much more wind potential. Therefore, we have now to look to the details what happens with the switch to auctioning in wind power system in Germany with the beginning of 2017? And you see now, in 2016, we had a lot of new permissions given for new wind power investment because all the investors feared that auctioning will come and hurried up to make their investment. Therefore, we have a peak in 2016 and in 2017 and 18, it nearly collapsed. Why? All the decentralized investors, the cooperatives and others, they cannot take part on optioning. The hurdles are too high. And you see it also in the investment. It comes then this year. 2017 was realized under construction a lot of the permissions that was given under the fit-in tariff system in 2016. Therefore, we have a big investment in 2017, but now, last year, first it shows that we have nearly no permissions and the investment declines, cut by the half in Germany. And you see, the bidding is the reason. These are the bits, what we had now in the last two years, the number of the years is the end where the bidding have to be constructed. And you see the bidding goes down. 
And with going down, the price for the feed-in tariff that was given by the bids increased, not decreased. Auctioning is not the best option to find the cheapest investment. That's a clear outcome. And we have the same situation seen in Zola. These are the feed-in tariffs from 2004. It was very high. Zola was very expensive. With feed-in tariff, we could decline very sharply. But then with auctioning in the free field areas, there was not really a sharp decline. Declining of the ghost goes only with one issue. This is an increasing of the global market with a learning curve. The bigger the market will be, the cheaper the prices of the equipment will become. And auctioning is limiting the investment by the volume what you can bid. And so auctioning worldwide is an instrument to decline a fast learning curve, a fast increasing. Yes, we are happy, and we could hear from Irina the figures how fast it grows, but the world could grow much faster in plenty areas when they go with the best instruments. And you see what happened in Europe and in Germany with the switch to auctioning. Europe, the blue line, was the leading area in the world with renewable energies until 2011 and 2012. And partly one nation after the other switched to auctioning and the investment in Europe declined, cut by the half in the last year nearly from the peak in 2011. And more interesting is Germany, the black line. You see last year in Germany, the investment into renewables is under the investment of 2004. And the reason is clear, not only the switch to auctioning, but it takes a lot part of it. So it is not the best instrument. And therefore, I would like to show you what would be the advice, what we should be in Ukraine and in other countries. Auctioning first, we must recognize, leads to fewer investment and not to stimulate big investment plenty investment. Auctioning excludes small and medium actors, but the feed-in tariff stimulates a faster cost decline. Conclusion is, yes, we can make auctioning in this investment field where auctioning is the best. Utility scaled, above 40 megawatt. It is okay. It is the best instrument. But you should change your law in Ukraine that you can let take part the decentralized actors to make a big and the best fit in tariff system, a green tariff system for all the investors, for the private people, the farmers and others <coughs> under 40 megawatt. This is decisive when you go it. So the current legislation will not lead to a fast growth in Ukraine. So my advice is change it. And we can discuss more details. It is important also to look to the green tariff. You give green tariff only to 2030 in this law. This is too short payback period, and you will see nearly no investment with a green tariff when this law will come in force. You have to change it. You can cut the feed-in tariff. Yes, it is too high, but not cut the feed-in tariff payback period. Take the principles what we introduced in Germany in 2000, and the principles are clear. We need a privileged grid access a feed-in tariff that is high enough that the investor can have a return of investment and a guaranteed period for remuneration. And I advise you also make a new modern feed-in tariff 
We all on the world have the problem that the big utility scale investment in a 100 megawatt wind park here, 100 megawatt solar park there, the grid operators have big problems. They say we have to balance these huge amounts of fluctuating solar and wind. So give an incentive, give and fit in tariff for investors who themselves balance with their investment. Give and fit in tariff for a 100% renewables balanced investment on the locality. It is not yet realized anywhere in the world, but you could be the first one who do it. And then you have the problem, not more, that the grid operators do not know how to balance it and have huge cost. The batteries, the power to gas and others should come from the investors who invest into wind and solar power and they can do it with a mixed investment with 100% renewables. This would be the best idea to make it. And then you can come to decentralized investment, to 100% renewable targets and investment. And we have a big movement in the world. We have about 50 nations in the world who have this decision. And Irina made a wonderful report with the best practice with the coalition of action. We published it in Irina um, this January. And you can learn a lot from this paper how to come to the best practice with policies. You can learn from other nations, from cities, from uh, states. For example, you can learn that California or the Spanish island Baleas or the state Washington DC, they have even a law for 100% renewables, not only a target, a law to do it. This is important to come here also. And let me highlight at the end, what would it bring when Ukraine goes to 100% renewables? We see it on a simulation, what we could realize, the Energy Watch Group together with Lapin Ranta University in Finland, we simulated all Europe, including Ukraine and Turkey and other European nations, we simulated a 100% renewable system over all energy sector, transport, heating, cooling, and electricity and others. And the findings are really, really great. You will be astonished what will happen. First is, we have a switch to a fuel, zero fuel electricity system in 2050, when you have achieved 100% renewables, you have it driven in heating sector and in transport sector, mostly by electricity, fuel-free electricity. These yellow pillars are fuel, what you avoid to spend. The electricity generation will increase, therefore, dramatically, five times more in Ukraine, but you can phase out nuclear power, coal power, natural gas power, and everything else. You can come to 100% renewables. Wind power and solar power are the main pillars of the coming electricity system. And the cost, this is interesting, because avoiding the fuel cost, you have only investment cost and operation cost, and these are cheaper under the line than the today's existing system. You can decline the consumer cost in Ukraine when you go to 100% renewables. And this is a figure from all Europe. We have it not yet from Ukraine, decentralized. But you see the employment increase, plenty million new employees, even when we take in aspect that the coal mining and others and natural gas will phase out. But we have more employment under the sun. So we could create a plan for Ukraine how to come to 100% renewables on technology and economy view with all the decentralized technologies in, um, in, in batteries, in power to gas, in storages, hydro pump power stations, with wind power, with geothermal, with um, hydro 
with um, bioenergy and solar and everything is included and the best mix. We make the policy advising it is much more than the discussion between auctioning and feed-in tariff. We need a lot of plenty more um, decisions in the um, policy system. But when you go this way, and we can advise you, and I want to hope that you will come to 100% renewable Ukraine, this is the best way to overcome poverty, to increase economy, to make political independence, and to achieve Paris goals. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Prell, for your uh, interesting presentation. It's always nice to see, to hear also some uh, different voices. Uh, if there is anyone that wants to make questions for Mr. Prell and the German experience, please. Yes, hello. <coughs> I will ask my question in English. I represent UNITA, United Nations Industrial Development Organization. I'm expert on uh, financing and policy for energy efficiency. This is not the exact uh, area for UNITA. However, we consult about you know clean technology and uh, green technology transition to developing countries, etc. But this is a very good presentation. I even would say the comments very useful, especially for the development of this um, uh, law for auctioning. And of course, uh, it was a big warning, especially from the business community, that with uh, even an idea of introducing this auctioning law, and we've seen this on the market, the um, belief of investors, especially of the medium-scale investors, into investing to Ukraine uh, would degrade, and it happened. Of course, uh, the big actors um, um, apparently uh, they have a different level of sensitivity in the in their business development models, so they are not that vulnerable. So I have a few questions. First of all, for how long did you have the fit uh, scheme in Germany in years? In Germany, we had the fit in tariff law on different levels. The first switch to auctioning came as a law with 2012 yes. in ground-mounted photovoltaic systems, yeah. open field. The second was 2014 with bioenergy, mm -hmm. and the third is now 2017 in wind power. Okay, so you basically, uh, in your experience, which um, I assume can be also given as, as, a, as a suggestion, you also had a kind of a different adaptation scenario for transition from feed to auctioning. Yeah, we had a big discussion in Germany and we had a lot of warning people yeah. to do it yeah. and all this warning became reality. Yeah. After this introduction auctioning in photovoltaic free field system, the investment nearly declined by the more than a half. In biomass, we have in energy sector nearly no investment today in Germany. And in wind power, now it happens. I showed it in the figures in wind power. And did you have a balance in the requirement when you introduced the auctioning scheme? Sorry? Did you have a balance in the requirement when you have introduced the auctioning scheme? No. There is no uh, balancing support. Yeah. It would be very, very necessary yeah. because now we stay at the moment that we have a lot of curtailment of wind power. We have a lot of um, investment of the grid operators necessity. We could avoid this when we make a decentralized balanced in uh, investment with a mix of renewables and the best mix of, uh, of, of um, storage systems yes. and yeah. with sector coupling. Instead of curtailment wind power, it would be better to feed up the batteries of electric cars and buses. Okay. So, j okay, just, no, yeah, uh, just, just the I'm last asking, one. Uh, I, you sorry. Know, yeah, I have to leave uh, the floor for another question. No, th th this is the conclusion. This is very important. So, will it be correct to assume that with the German experience that had a longer adaptation period, 
no balance in requirement, no balance in requirement, and SEP system for uh, bas basically mitigating the different uh, supply, uh, supply periods into the energy system, you still had the investment degradation with introduction of the auctioning scheme. And will it be correct to assume that if in Ukraine we will have balancing requirement, no, uh, not long, but a short adaptation period for businesses, and no continuous fit scheme that we will have a much bigger decline in investment into this area. Yes, you have already investors in Ukraine who go to balanced investment with a mix of renewables and a mix of storage systems. And this is what you have to stimulate. Then you have much less problems in your grid system and, and others. So go on it. And you have the investors here. You have to stimulate them by the best legislation. And I mentioned it, make a balanced, <coughs> fit-in tariff that stimulates a 100% renewable balanced investment. Thank you. Okay, if uh, there is one more question, but then uh, we pass to the next presenter. Yes, hello, this is uh, Magnus Johansson. I represent uh, Scotic Solar, a global solar investor, and we are currently building around one gigawatt around the world, um, key partner of EBRD. I think uh, I first want to just applaud the presentation um, and also applaud the questions because they're very relevant. And it's interesting to see that the decision makers of Ukraine are not unfortunately here to hear this discussion. Um, that is one key point and I think what we are seeing around the world in different markets are quite similar to what is being mentioned here and that is the auction schemes are so unpredictable in the outcomes that as an investor we would probably prefer a feed-in tariff market with clear set levels rather and, and accept a slight lower return than auction schemes because we see it in so many markets around the world where you have amazing bid rounds and it's out in all the newspapers but then the projects are not built or they contain. So I think um, I know, of course, in Ukraine there needs to be a change. Uh, and I think one big difference between Ukraine and Germany is, of course, that in Germany you have higher purchasing power, and you had it before as well. So it was an easier argument to present uh, in, in, in Germany compared to in Ukraine. But I think from our side, given that we are active in Ukraine, we are currently building several plants around the country. Uh, we would like to see, and our CEO was presenting this in a speech when Mr. Groisman was also in Norway a few weeks ago, and also the head of EBRD was, please try to contain momentum. If you sort of just cut off and throw in a new system, you will probably lose momentum. You will probably generate for investors like internationals, the view that, okay, now we have to go back and we have to reevaluate, and the cost of capital goes back up. So that's it. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, we have to pass to the next uh, uh, presenter because we are running already out of time. I'm sorry to cut you off, but you can continue to discuss this uh, outside. Uh, so uh, thank you for your presentation again, Mr. Fell. Uh, surely you will uh, find uh, many people that will uh, have to make you other questions. So I'm, we are passing now to Fabian Wigand, uh, Associate Director of Navigant. Uh, he will present us uh, some of the experience around the world from the AOS project. So Wigand, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Um, today I will focus mostly on, on the process. So particularly on the process, what you have to consider within the next six months when you actually go into details of designing the auction and making some crucial and sometimes tough decisions. Um, I will, where possible, mention international examples. But let me give me one opportunity only to, 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 to react to, to Mr. Feld's comments because I, some of his um, views I share and some of them I don't share. So I think it's definitely the case that it has become more difficult for smaller producers, particularly citizen cooperatives, to produce. And therefore, they are now limited to rather smaller sizes. 
and they are basically missing in the market now. So that we can see actually this is one of the reasons why we have less investments. Um, we have to see, I mean, that not so much renewables were built up in Germany after introduction of the auction scheme is partly because it's a volume control system, right? So if the volume had been set higher, also more renewable energy would have been built up. So it's important to know this is a volume control scheme. If the German government made a decision not to support that much renewables in that scheme, not so much will be built up. Um, another thing to consider is why have wind onshore prices recently increased in Germany? And this is also interesting because you can see it is m reacting to market signals. And for an auction to work, you need sufficient competition. Now, it can be that, for example, the case in Germany was that you simply don't have enough pre-developed projects anymore because it has been extremely difficult to develop wind projects. Um, you often don't get the permits. There are, there are um, lawsuits against them and so on. So there was not enough supply and therefore price increased. That can sometimes be the case and it's not always a necessarily bad thing because it can also signal to investors, well, this actually there's, it makes sense to invest again. So it's not always this always auctions reduce prices, but they are very fast to react to price signals. So, for example, in the case that financing becomes more expensive or less expensive, in the case modules become more or less expensive, in the case regula regulation enables more or less producers in the field, auctions are often fast to react, while often administratively set tariffs, in the past at least, were often too slow to react. So they either too high or too low, they're sometimes too slow. So it can be the case that if administrators set tariffs, feed tariffs set really good to experts, very fast, can also have certain elements of an auction, fast price reaction, but in the past it often has not been the case. Um, we can, I think we can have a whole hour discussion on the Germany case, um, happy to do so also after that. Um, just want to give this quick statement, but coming now to the case of um, how to introduce um, auctions the best way. So, um, I mean, briefly to us, Navigant, um, partly also formerly Ecofis, we have been working for 20 years in, in designing auctions and um, analyzing auctions worldwide in Europe, but also in the US. By the way, also feed and tariff schemes and other schemes, but recently of auctions. And we are part of the RS2020 program. And um, something it's important that I think if we look at this, this, this process, it's really important to understand what is actually changing now when we move from feed and tariffs to auctions. On the one hand, we have more volume control by the government and we have an increased price competition because projects compete against each other. However, it's also adding new risk for bidders. This is often the pre-development cost and therefore also the risk of sunk costs. So it could be that a project developer is developing a project, won't be awarded, and therefore suddenly has this risk, the cost already that he doesn't get back. Often auctions are rather fast to reflect market prices. So changing financing conditions, changing module prices and so on, it's really fast to react to that, but they also require competition. One of the main thing to consider is in the auction design, how can we ensure that competition is as high as possible? How can we ha give as many actors as possible access to the scheme? How can we ensure that the penalties, etc., are not too high, so we enable particular participation, but are high enough so projects will be realized? That's kind of the holy grail in the auctions, right? You have to find a way somehow to projects will be realized, but investors won't be scared. And auctions are becoming more difficult for some smaller bidders. Why is that the case? Well, I mean, if you look at the auction scheme, basically the government sets the price and the market sets the volume. So the market themselves de decides basically how much um, renewable energy they want to act at. And that, of course, can lead to a situation where you act m at more than originally intended to. Um, in an auction scheme, the government sets the volume and the market sets the price. So the government signals to the market we actually want to um, purchase that and that much. But the, the price itself, whether it be higher or lower, will be determined by market forces. So what do you need to, how can you, if you now in the coming six weeks, and I know you've already started the process, which is wonderful, how we can prepare for auctions? Because I think there are a lot of things you can learn from other countries, but it's really important not to apply one case from one country to another. You really have to tailor them. Tailor them. You have to tailor them the political to market institutional readiness of the country. In terms of policy goals, 
policy goals might be different, right? Some countries w might want to, the aim might be to reduce costs as much as possible. I also feel that Ukraine, the idea is to reduce the costs strongly for consumers. Other countries really want a lot of volume control. So they want to control, for example, which areas renewables are being built up, maybe because they have limited group capabilities, or they want to um, ensure that they uh, achieve their generation targets. And often these two goals can be a bit conflicting. Right? So um, the more you burden you put on the developer to, to realize projects, to build them, to steer them, to, to penalize them if necessary, the more you also might have higher prices because investors will price and risk. There are also other goals in the system, uh, in, in the design. For example, you want to maybe ensure good in system integration. You want to make it more attractive to, to, to connect um, at better grid sites. Maybe you want to have local value chain creation. And that's all fine. But you have to be aware that this will all have then consequences on the auction result. And if you make it very complicated, there's a risk that the bidders might not understand the system fully or that yourself might not even understand the system fully. So be aware of these trade-offs. Second, market readiness. So you have to, ideally, you have to understand before the auction really well the size of the market. How many local developers do we have? How many international developers might come in? How concentrated are there? Is there risk of collusion, for example, that bidders coordinate the risks? Then also you have to see, is there competition with another remuneration scheme? So do maybe developers have an edge um, an incentive to make projects smaller to be still be under the feed and tariff? Or can they sell the power somewhere else? Because all of this will then have an impact on the competition level in the auction. And you want to make sure that when you have the auction for a certain volume, that you will have more supply for this than demand. So you want to have more project volume bidding in an auction than demand. Because otherwise, you will have the case like the last auction in Germany for wind where your prices went up a bit. That can happen, right? So you have to be aware that you should really make sure that there is enough competition. Then also check the risk and duration of project development phases. How easy is it to receive a permit? How likely is it that if you get an award, that the project can still fail maybe in the auction? Because maybe you get an auction award, you can build the project, but then you don't receive the environmental permit or you don't receive a certain building permit. So it makes sense that if you notice now already that there are certain um, permits that are very difficult to obtain that really can make the project fail that you probably want to get them before the auction award already to make sure that not half of the projects you award actually are failing. You also have to be aware how long does it take to develop a project. I mean if you have a realization rate of two years and afterwards there are penalties but it will take three years to receive a permit then you have to factor that in because you don't want projects to fail only because they don't receive certain permits on time. You also have to assess the available funding. So to what extent are there domestic capital markets that can actually finance already auctions? To what extent do you need international finance? Will it be more debt or equity based? How prepared are the markets? How is the risk perception among different investors? If you notice that a lot of small investors, you have to do a different scheme than if you want to particularly attract larger utilities that are operated worldwide. So be aware of what you want and what you can achieve here. And the next one is institution, institution, institutional readiness. So the question is here, depending on the type of auction and the implementation timeline and the desire for scalability, you actually might choose very different auction designs. So a very complex online dynamic real-time auction scheme might be interesting for some cases because they are really efficient and um, but they would also require a lot of knowledge from developers. They would require a lot of time to plan this. And there's sometimes a risk that if you want to achieve too many objectives at the same time with an auction, it becomes too complex. It becomes complex in a way that you have to agree on a certain parameter. So if, if, if you give a bonus or a malus for certain projects, how high should that bonus be? And it's really easy to get that wrong. And it becomes complicated because it might also open up the opportunity for unwanted strategic bidding, that some bidders know the system and play the system. You also really want to align the different institutions within the government, the ministries, maybe the grid operators, permitting authorities, energy regulators, and so on. Because they would probably all have different incentives 
but they need to work together. For example, you want to make sure as an auctioning authority that the permitting is rather smooth and easy. The grid operator, particularly if it's a state-owned utility, it might actually have an interest to have its own plants produce the energy and not the independent power producers. So it can just curtail plants unnecessarily, and that has often been the case in many countries. So be aware that you ensure that all the different agencies are aligned and you have one defined goal. And if you don't have that, then try do the time to define that goal because the design you will choose and the outcome you will have will very much depend on defined, this defined goal. Trust, transparency, and independence. The off-taker and the auction scheme have to be trustful. You should not cancel an auction easily. You should really make sure that you have long-term reliable investment signals with long-term reliable investment volumes. Transparency. Try to make the system as transparent as possible. Try not to leave too much space for post-award negotiations. So don't have too many bilateral negotiations after the auction, but try to let bidders really stick to these prices, because otherwise they are more prone to corruption. Also try to have it rather price-based, um, because this will then also increase transparency. Have an independent auction authority. And use international best practices, but tailor these to individual cases. This is an overview on the design process. Very briefly, we have the target definition and the market and regulatory analysis. Then we have the auction design, the implementation process, and the evaluation. The evaluation is also really important. I mean, if you do a pilot auction, evaluate it accordingly. What else is there to, to consider? Um, build capabilities within the government on auctions. Align working groups and have trainings. People involved in the design of the auction should know what is the impact of different designs. They should maybe also once go into the perspective of a bidder. With the Energy um, Community Secretariat and Irina in the past, we actually have done simulations for, for um, governments, government officials. So they actually had more once had to become a bidder in a simulated auction and they could therefore learn certain effects such as sunk costs and winner excursions and so on. Sometimes it's better to experience these things your own because only then you can, you can design these projects well. And something that is also important, try to understand what bidders want. And maybe there are also different types of bidders that have different interests. Try to understand the risk of the bidders. So, for example, the bid risk with sunk costs, the risk to pre-develop a project, spend a lot of money on an environmental permit, building permit, and so on, and not getting an award. If this happens too often to bidders, they might not bid anymore. On the other hand, you want to do bidders to do a certain preparation. You have the penalty risk. So it could be that projects are not being realized or strongly delayed. This can be the bidder's fault, but sometimes not. So sometimes it is that simply uh, parts are stuck in the customs, that certain permits have not been obtained so far. So try to make the permitting process and the customs duty process as smooth as possible to ensure that there won't be delays. And revenue risk. These can, so the risk that actually, if you have a PPA signed, that you won't get paid as a bidder what you were supposed to get paid. And these can be the off-taker risk, so the risk that the off-taker does not pay you what he owes you. This can be because the off-taker maybe is defaulting, it's bankrupt, often the case in many countries. Um, I think countries like Kazakhstan have done a good job actually to, to ensure that guarantees and so on increase the credibility of off-takers. And that's the risk of curtailment that was mentioned before, right? So what do you do if you are a renewable energy producer, but you actually cannot feed in that much energy as you could theoretically because there are good issues all the time? Political risk, so the risk of expropriation, contract breach, and changes in law. Make sure that project developers know the, the can, can plan with these revenues. And currency risks, so for example, currency fluctuation and exchange, currency exchange controls are a huge problem, although I'm aware that I think for the Ukraine you plan to do that in Euro, which definitely is, is a good idea here. Of course, know that the more you actually accommodate the bidders here, that is also a risk you take as a government, right? If you ensure against containment, if you compensate 
the bidder if there's containment, then it might be that you have to pay a lot of money continuously. So make, do, do yourself a favor and do a good evaluation. Which risk are we willing to take on? Which risk should, do we want to pass on to the bidders? Avoid collusion, that's very important. So particularly in small markets or markets that are very concentrated with few bidders only, there is a risk the bidders coordinate their bids and therefore receive more payment than they should. And you can limit this usually through rather simple auction designs and through no post-auction negotiations. So make sure that you rather create an auction that the bidders and the yourself understand. Second thing is prepare the bidders. You want the bidders to understand the auction well and to know auction behavior because this way they can bid a realistic price. And you want, of course, you want the prices to be as low as possible, but you also want them to be realistic. You don't want to award a lot of projects to a very, very cheap price that will not be built. Give bidders sufficient preparation time. Of course, it depends. Do bidders have to pre-develop the project a lot? Do they have to secure certain permits or not? Do you have a large amount of pre-developed projects already available that can bid the auction or not? But make sure that as many bidders as possible can participate in the auction. And be aware that, of course, also bidders will take some time for the decision to invest in, in the Ukraine, or if they act from the Ukraine already, to assess the new law, to understand it, to get finance support and so on. So make sure you don't do these changes too rapidly. And involve them early on. Involve bidders through pre-bid conferences, for example, where you explain the auction scheme, where you advertise the auction scheme to attract more bidders, where you answer open questions. And maybe also to trainings and auction simulations. The bidders really understand what they can enter. And address their concerns. For example, ask them for feedback on RFPs, on requests for proposal. Ask them for feedback for draft laws, because they might see something that you might yourself might not see. Provide guarantees. And then maybe also exempt certain size of technologies from the auction where you think there's not enough competition. I think with a view on time, I'm going to skip this part. Please ask me about it later. It's really interesting. It's basically the key question, how can we ensure that system and grid integration costs are also considered in an auction? Because we don't want prices to be as low as possible. We also want system and grid integration costs to be as low as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Fabian, for your presentation, and thank you for being time sensitive. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, skipping uh, the question part, uh, but I'm sure that uh, people would want, like to make you a question. I invite everyone uh, to approach him after this uh, session. So we're passing now to Vasilios Sanatolis, which uh, is a member of the Fraunhofer Institute, and uh, we also part of the Hours 2 project. And, uh, it will uh, present us uh, some of the elements of this uh, new project. Uh, Vasilios, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so far. Sorry, and uh, I'm going to ask you to stay between 10 15 minutes uh, for your. Uh, I'll do my best. It's quite brief. Highly political, but very yeah. brief. <laughs> Um, so far, we've heard a lot about the auctions in general, advantages, even disadvantages, problems with auctions. Um, but I'm trying to be um, more specific in my presentation. I'm trying um, to address, to give some recommendations regarding the law here in Ukraine. If the presentation is coming. Perfect. So a lot of, um, first of all, who are we? Oris 2, it was mentioned a couple of times before. Um, we have actually a research project under the Horizon 2020 framework of the European um, Commission. Uh, we, are, uh, we consist of 11 research institutions and policy con consultancies from all over Europe. And our main idea, our main research focus is um, the analysis um, the design and the implementation of renewable energy auctions. So we um, publish a lot of reports, um, a lot of ideas, analysis, case studies in different countries to try to improve the design of auctions, renewable energy auctions. So what are we doing here in Ukraine, actually? 
Um, the energy community, together with the European Commission, um, approached us and asked us um, to support Ukraine in the process of designing the auctions. Um, so we provided some detailed recommendations in form of a table. I will come back to that later. Uh, on the draft law on renewable energy auctions, um, and actually our, we tried, um, and I think we succeeded, that our comments are actually in line with the joint donors' um, letter. Uh, we work together with Berlin Economics as well as Dixie Group here from Ukraine. And of course, we exchanged ideas and um, cooperated a lot with the Energy Committee of the Parliament as well as the European Commission. Um, so, actually, we prepared a table with a lot of recommendations specifically based on the um, different provisions of the law. Um, for today, I'm trying to be a little bit more concise and to give you a little bit of an appetizer regarding um, what we, what we um, developed. So first of all, if I may quote um, our colleague from the EBRD, Adil, um, as he said, investors like a very easy to, understand, uh, easy to understand simple auction design. That's why we propose that the auction design to have a robust framework that it is implemented in the law, a lot of design elements. And to keep it as simple as possible, so far the draft law did a really good job. So what are we talking about? Um, we propose a one-stage price bidding procedure, um, sealed bids so nobody, the bidders don't know the submitted bids of the other participants, um, a pay as bid award so every bidder receives the price he quoted or he submitted in his bid. Um, we want a price only scheme. This means um, nothing else is considered besides the pre-qualification, of course, but in the award only the price plays a role. We want a fixed support period. Then the PPA should be fixed for the whole support period, of course, with a fixed strike price. We would like to stress this fact of technology-specific auctions, so each technology gets its own quota, its own volume. Location neutral, except auction. This means that um, there is no predetermined um, location in the auction, but every bidder has its own location for its own project. Um, except for Chernobyl, um, as a, the only special um, volume we see where we actually have a, um, a certain location where, it is, um, where the project should be developed. And we could imagine the same for wind offshore, but we don't see wind offshore um, coming to Ukraine or auctions taking place until 2025. Then the ceiling price should be in the law as well, a certain mechanism um, above which bidders cannot bid. Then penalties, of course, for delays and infringements, so the projects are actually realized. Then pre-qualification requirements to participate. We want them to ensure only serious bidders and bidders who are capable to realize the projects. The qualification, uh, qualification stage, this means to check for the pre-qualification criteria should be after the bids are actually opened, but not disclosed to the public. And another important point is the support that should be stated in euro. So you might ask yourself, what about the volumes, which is one of the most important design elements to actually um, influence the competition in the auction, which we have heard is the, one of the most important parts. Can I have the next slide, please? It's not... Perfect. Uh, so, as we've mentioned, we want technology-specific volumes. What are we talking about? Which technologies? Solar PV, wind onshore, the Chernobyl region should have its own volume, biomass, biogas, small hydro, and geothermal as well. Don't combine them. Don't make something technology neutral, a basket auction out of it, at least until 2025. Um, then the volumes should be um, announced or determined by the Cabinet of Ministers, uh, which prepares a five-year plan in each December for the next five years, and this on a rolling basis. This means in every December they decide for the next five years. The point is we have a trade-off here, a very important one. Do we want flexibility for the government or investor confidence? So we came up with this provision to say, okay, we can have this annual revision in each December for the next five years, but what can the Cabinet of Ministers actually do? So the first year, that, so the next year, 
is actually fixed. There's no change possible in the auction volume for each technology. In the second and third year following, a deviation of plus or minus 20% should be implemented or can be implemented by the cabinet. And in the fourth and fifth year, it's in the total discretion of the cabinet of ministers. They can set any um, volume they like for each technology. What is important, as my colleague Fabian has already mentioned, it's important to understand and to evaluate each auction. So we say um, in each year we want, a, or a, a, a public report should be um, um, conducted, an analysis of the previous auction results and how, how, it, um, how it went. As well as all the volumes should actually be based on some kind of market studies, potential analysis, um, to have some kind uh, of an idea what, um, which level is appropriate to have enough competition. Another important uh, point to have competition is the threshold. So on the left hand side we see the current provisions. In our opinion it's way too high, even for such a um, transition period of three years. In contrast we would suggest much lower thresholds. We are talking about solar PV 1 megawatt, wind onshore 3 megawatts or 3 turbines and the other rest 1 megawatt. All of these should be obliged, uh, obligated to participate um, in the auction scheme. Furthermore, we oppose the 15% trigger rule for REST technologies, which means um, it's in the draft law that above um, technologies which provide more than 50% of the REST generation in Ukraine have to participate in auctions. Abolish that and send all of, um, all, all of the um, REST sources directly to auctions. Another important point is that we need a clear definition of what is actually a single project. In our uh, recommendations, we actually have an idea that we use the distance uh, between the uh, project, the plants, as well as although we allow for a certain split into stages, which has other implications if you have to participate or not in the auction. The point is, again, we want competition. Furthermore, um, under this threshold I've just presented, we wouldn't allow the, um, the projects to participate in the auctions. This means a 500 kilowatt project shouldn't be allowed to participate. You might ask why. We want competition, don't we? If you see on the right hand side, what will happen? The blue ones are the weak bidders, the small project, projects. They have a higher LCOE than the big pro projects. So what might happen in the first, in one auction round, we will see this one without the arrows. The strong bidders will understand this and say, okay, look at that. We have a lot of weak bidders with high LCOE that cannot go further down. So what will happen the next round? They will increase the prices according um, to the weak bidders' prices. So wh what will we get? Of course, we have competition, but we will have um, higher prices in the end of the day which we want to avoid here. This argument doesn't only hold for the smaller projects but uh, under the threshold, but the same for um, the medium-sized projects compared, for example, can we really compare a two megawatt project to a 100 megawatt? Not at all, we will have the same project, uh, problem. So what we, su what we um, um, suggest is actually to introduce medium-sized auctions within the rest source technology we are talking about. In this case, solar PV auctions from 1 to 5 megawatt and wind onshore auctions from 1 to 20. So, uh, these are just, this was just a first impression of what we recommended. Uh, we have prepared a whole table with the most important recommendations hand, hands on. Uh, this will be uh, provided to the, um, uh, to the Energy Committee um, next week, beginning of next week, in, um, tomorrow or beginning of next week, let's see, in English and Ukrainian. Um, and whoever is interested in, um, in receiving that can either contact me or the, Dixie, the colleagues from Dixie Group. We are happy to provide you with that. Um, furthermore, if I may say that, um, during the work here I saw there are a lot of, a lot of positions on this law and contrary pro, uh, positions in, in the parliament. I can understand it. It's a very hot topic. 
a lot of interests. But in the end of the day, uh, I want to argue that it's important to find a compromise on that and that this law is actually signed. Because I don't see any alternative besides that for a green transition and uh, a, a good future for the rest of development here in Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vasilios. This was very interesting, very nice to hear some uh, direct hands on uh, suggestion for Ukraine. So, uh, as I said, we don't have time for questions, maybe later. We should have had uh, Rafael Ferreira from the Brazilian electricity market uh, uh, operator to present, but he couldn't be here. And uh, now, wait, uh, um, we've talked that we should move the, um, the video later if we have time. So I would ask uh, uh, Mr. Duffy, director from KBPP Management, uh, to start his uh, presentation and uh, to um, introduce us about with his experience with the biomass uh, plant deployment. If we have time later, we will have the video from Mr. Ferreira. Yeah, just waiting for the slide there. Ah, there we go. Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Dara Duffy, and I am a director of KBPP, who are developing a 44.2 megawatt biomass power plant in the Kalnitsky region. I would like to thank SAI, the Committee for Fuel and Energy, and IRENA for the opportunity to speak at this conference about the investor issues currently experienced in attracting investment into the electricity market in Ukraine. One question frequently asked of us as investors is, why Ukraine? Well, we firmly believe that each country and region should look at their natural resources in order to identify suitable and sustainable forms of green energy. Ukraine is renowned for its grain production, and so, it's, so it follows, Ukraine should, could and should become renowned for biomass energy. The single largest issue in any biomass power plant project is, is there a reliable source of fuel supply? Ukraine has this in abundance, and so Ukraine is an obvious place for a biomass power plant and indeed could have a whole industry. The scale of grain production in Ukraine means that Ukraine could easily have over 100 similar plants without impacting on the current uses for straw. If there was investment on this kind of scale, it would propel Ukraine to become a world leader in, in biomass power plants. KBPP, as investors, having decided that Ukraine had a plentiful supply of biomass fuel, did some further investigation and were surprised to learn that despite a plentiful supply of biomass and on the face of it an attractive green tariff regime, that there were actually no large-scale biomass power plants in Ukraine. This then begs the question, why have no large-scale biomass power plants been built in Ukraine thus far? Previously, the primary issue was the requirement for the annual renewal of the PPA, which stalled most renewal projects, but through a collaborative work between the members of the RADA, the IFIs, SAE and IRENA, and many more, a solution was secured so that investors could be attracted. Unfortunately, the delay in obtaining this solution has resulted in a shortened feed-in tariff duration, which due to the capital-intensive nature and longer lead times of a biomass power plant meant that investors felt there was insufficient equity return for the risk involved. So while the previous green tariff regime was a significant step forward in legislative terms, it still lacked some of the necessary support and structures to ensure that Ukraine has a thriving biomass power plant. Uh, industry. We would therefore welcome the switch to an auction system. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about our project, um, so far we have secured the site, the, supply, the fuel supply, the grid connection, letters of intent, the SIA, logistics, uh, EPC, o and contracts, everything is in, is in place, final permitting is, is substantially in place. The only thing, that, the last piece that we're lacking, obviously, is the financing. Now, this is a project that has attracted interest from parties in the US, Europe, Middle East, Asia, 
and investors will liken the project and recognising the potential for biomass in Ukraine, ultimately we're not prepared to invest due to the risk and returns, which we will come to later. So if I just explain the difference in the capex requirements for these projects. So um, when you look at the technology price per megawatt in Ukraine, biomass unfortunately does not compare favourably with wind and solar. Biomass uh, plants approximately cost 4 million per megawatt compared with 1 million per megawatt for wind and 1.1 million per megawatt for solar. So, but although biomass does not compare favourably on the face of it, it does have other benefits that wind and solar do not, such as it offers energy balance. This project would provide a stable, predictable base load power to the grid, assisting with the management of solar and wind developments. Energy security. The development of, this, of the sector will allow Ukraine to reduce its reliance on imports of fuels to provide its energy needs. The other benefits are, are in relation to the multiplier effect. Uh, in, in terms of jobs, each plant would provide more than 450 jobs, including 156 full-time permanent, well-paid jobs in the plant in operations and supply chain. Uh, there's also benefits for the, the agricultural sector in that there would be 5.7 million year boost to local farmers for, in order to obtain their straw. Um, I also think biomass projects can act as a, a conduit from which Ukraine could attract more foreign direct investment uh, because outside of Ukraine people can't see the potential for biomass. Um, and lastly, I would just say biomass can make a large contribution towards Ukraine's COP21 commitments. Um, I was asked to look at the, the effects um, of the switch to auctions in other jurisdictions. So we particularly looked at the UK. Um, in general terms, as you can see from the chart, uh, the auction system led to a cut in price for established technologies like onshore wind and solar, but did not lead to any similar cut in price in the less well-established technologies such as biomass or biogas. The UK, if you look at the on offshore wind there at the bottom of the chart, the UK purposely prioritised offshore wind as they viewed it as the most promising untapped resource. And they did see a cut in price uh, for this too, but this drop in price took several years to materialise. Uh, if we just go on, maybe look at the, the lessons from the UK auction system. Uh, some of the lessons from the implementation of the UK auction system were that it was necessary to differentiate between mature and immature technologies, uh, as each can be at a different stage of development and therefore require different stimuli. Uh, overall, the implementation of the auction system did lead to the desired reduction in government spending when compared with the previous ROCKS incentive scheme. Uh, however, the outcomes differed between established technologies and those that were le less established. Uh, what the UK auction system did well, it had a controlled rollout of the well-established technology market, limiting solar and onshore wind, as was desired. It reined in large government spending on renewable energy incentives. It reduced the price per solar significantly, uh, reflecting the real price of delivery for the technology. It alleviated the burden on UK taxpayers by only having to provide the top-up element. And it also led to an on offshore wind boom, which was widely considered to be the UK's primary route to decarbonised energy security. There was, however, some criticism of the programme. Um, some felt it was uh, complex and cumbersome during the, the bid phase. There was slow uptake in the initial years as transition arrangements were not used. Uh, it also resulted in uncommercial bidding and projects not reaching construction phase as non-development penalties were relatively low. It also had no long-term commitment from the government as budgets were announced annually, which made it very difficult for investors to plan their strategy in any kind of long-term basis. So that's something you may want to keep in mind. Um, if I go on and give a, a view, an investor view on the, the proposed U Ukraine auctions, um, there are positive views on the, the, the auction. 
Um, I believe it will be reliable long-term revenue streams which are essential to attracting finance. Um, it appears that it will be fair, transparent rules and obligations will ensure a level playing field for all. Sealed, build, sealed, sealed bids will help to mitigate against collusion corruption risk and it will benefit end consumers with reduced prices in highly competitive markets. However, there are also some areas of concern. Uh, a focus solely on the price can encourage uncommercial bids, which may mean Ukraine misses the renewable, uh, renewables targets due to what's called quota blocking. This was actually experienced in the UK. Um, also, no assessment of bidders' ability to fulfil the project could lock up quotas. Um, for the initial years in the less established sectors, it could result in no price reductions or no projects being developed at all. Um, grid connection could become an area, a key area for concern regarding corruption because it's such a place is such an essential part to anybody's bid. But that's something for you to consider. Um, I'm not really going to spend too much on this slide because uh, I think it's been covered quite well today. Um, it's just pointing out some of the benefits of the auction system for Ukraine. But in addition to you know pricing, control over budgets, um, you know encouraging FDI, uh, I believe with the right approach, uh, the the auction system could replicate the UK's exploitation of their offshore wind potential, and we would believe that Ukraine's potential is undoubtedly in biomass. Uh, however, we would have some concerns. Um, again, uh, the grid balancing risks by focusing solely on price. Uh, the lack of penalties for non-development of projects could leave the country significantly short of its renewable energy targets. Uh, encouraging only solar and wind technologies does not provide the same multiplier effect throughout the country, um, so it's worth considering. Now, maybe to just give you a, a slide that will maybe bring home just why there hasn't been uh, biomass power plants uh, thus far in Ukraine, I think this slide probably illustrates that quite well. Uh, because as you can see from the chart, there's an imbalance between the risk and reward for biomass and it's compared similar sized wind and solar projects. This is because of the length of time that funds, investment funds must sit out before the investor sees any returns. I mean, there, it's 11 years, as you can see, the biomass there is, is, is in the green. Uh, uh, wind and solar are in red and blue there on the chart. We believe transitional arrangements are needed to allow biomass to proceed straight into auction process as the feed-in tariff does not, represent, does not benefit biomass due to the duration restrictions. On the other hand, uh, wind and solar can continue using the feed-in tariff before transitioning to auctions in accordance with the proposed legislation. So, really, in conclusion, uh, what I would say is Ukraine has a massive untapped resource that has currently not been used for the benefit of the country. Biomass represents a source of base load power that can be used to manage the electricity grid and could be potentially the source of electricity exports to the EU when market liberalisation is complete. What investors are looking for is certainty, duration and transparency, and we are hopeful that the auction system will provide this. A concern would be that because of the delay in the biomass auctions, the slow uptake of the initial years in auctions elsewhere and the long construction phase required to build large biomass power plants is that there will be no substantial biomass industry in Ukraine until nearly 2030. Biomass power plants could and should be a key part of Ukraine's wider green energy strategy along with wind and solar, but for this to materialise there needs to be regu regulatory fundamentals in place and the financial model will need to be attractive to potential investors. We are therefore asking that biomass is recognised as being less developed than other technologies and is included in the first round of auctions so that the biomass industry can play its part in ensuring that Ukraine meets their ambitious green energy targets. I would just like to thank, uh, finish by thanking you all for allowing us at KBBB to present to you about the investor issues currently experienced and um, I am available later for anyone that has any questions.
Thank you. Okay. Alan, come on. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Duffy, and uh, as for the other speakers, if there anyone has questions, please uh, post them uh, um, after this uh, event, after this panel, since we are running out of time. Um, I will pass now the floor to Andrin uh, Konechenkov, uh, President of the Ukrainian Wind Energy Association, that will likely introduce us uh, with the next uh, what the Ukrainian Wind Energy Association is expecting from the auction scheme. Uh, thank you very much. I will be very short, considering the time. But I want to first ask, is it necessary for the Ukraine to have green energy and in which quantity? I will now try to make a comparison of how it happens in the European Union, in Ukraine, and what we expect from the auction of the auction. Next slide. Якщо ми подивимося сьогодні на європейські країни, ми бачимо шалений розвиток розвитку вітроенергетичних технологій, і в багатьох країнах ми бачимо, що сьогодні щорічне виробництво електрики перевищує вже 44-45%. І цей рух не припиняється. Наступний слайд, будь ласка. І в вересні місяці в Гамбурзі в минулому році директор Міжнародного енергетичного агентства зробив прогноз для країн Європейського Союзу. До 40% планується виробництво саме електроенергії за рахунок вітру. Наступний слайд. Що ми сьогодні бачимо в Україні? Ми бачимо сьогодні всього приблизно біля 3 мільярдів кіловат-годин виробництва електроенергії, серед яких більше ніж третину займає саме вітроенергетика. І стосовно встановленої потужності, дякую, встановлено встановленої потужності, сьогодні у нас переважає сонце. Чому воно переважає? Ну, і, і хочу ще зауважити, що сьогодні переважна вітроенергетика і сонячна енергетика розвиваються все ж таки на півдні України, де величезний потенціал є використання як вітру, так і сонця. Але якщо порівняти сьогодні, наприклад, чому так шалено розвивається сонце, по-перше, це занадто високий зелений тариф. Якщо взяти вітроенергетику, насправді вона сьогодні генерує електроенергію всього 395 мегаватт, хоча зазначено 522, бо 4 вітростанції у нас знаходяться на тимчасово неконтрольованій території, і вони сьогодні не дають електроенергію за зеленим тарифом в Україні. Але якщо взяти виробництво електроенергії, от такої невеличкої кількості вітроелектростанцій і сонячні, у нас сьогодні 42% в загальному Виробництво все рік відновлення джерел енергії складає вітер і 39 сонця, при тому, що сонце у нас в 4 рази вище встановлено потужність. Я хочу показати вам табличку, це державне підприємство «Нерринок» прорахувало, наскільки впливає ціна і зелений тариф на ринок електричної енергії. У нас дуже часто говорять, що зелена енергетика займає, забирає з ринку 8%. Так от, якщо подивитися на ціни і на долю в ринку, то можна прорахувати такий коефіцієнт від частки енергії і від виробництва. Виходить, що сонце у нас коефіцієнт 6,9, а на все решту інших відновлень джерел складає 3,5, 3,47, це найменший коефіцієнт, який належить вітровій енергетиці. Сьогодні у нас заявлено, тільки знаходиться в стадії будівництва, 893 мегаватта вітроелектростанцій. Це проекти, по яким вже підписано контракти на поставку обладнання, і це проекти, які сьогодні до 2020 року мають бути впроваджені і підключені до електромереж. В девелопменті у нас знаходиться 3300 мегаватт. І це не просто декларативні проекти, це проекти, які зареєстровані на сайті Мінприроди і проходять оцінку впливу на довкілля, без якої сьогодні ви не зможете отримати дозвіл або декларацію на будівництво. Тобто сьогодні у нас є 
не просто потенціал, у нас сьогодні є достатньо високе зростання реальних проєктів. Я вже не кажу про декларативні проєкти, які останнім часом у нас називаються там 750 мегаватт, 500 мегаватт, це все я, проєкти, які мають розвиватися протягом 3-4 років, а не за півроку, як сьогодні декларується. І от тут ми доходимо якраз до аукціонів. Якщо ми сьогодні впровадимо аукціони без розуміння гравців ринку, ми просто зупинимо не просто розвиток, ми зірвемо контракти, які сьогодні підписані на постачання обладнання і на будівництво вітроелектростанцій. Головне, раніше, ніж 1 січня 2020 року, говорити про введення аукціонів – це неможливо, тому що сьогодні ще не запрацював ринок електричної енергії, ми взагалі не розуміємо, яка буде відповідальність за небаланси, скільки вона буде коштувати, як взагалі буде розвиватися ринок, хоча, знов-таки, повертаючись до Європейського Союзу і до презентації пана Фела, який казав, що коли в Німеччині і в інших країнах Європейського Союзу розвивалася вітроенергетика, ніхто за від... і так і зелена енергетика за небалансом ніхто не відповідав. По-друге, строк надання підтримки PPA 20 років. Ми цю цифру, я так розумію, що багато вже гравців ринку погодили її, тому що, наприклад, в багатьох європейських країнах, як Бельгія, Австрія, інших країнах, теж 20 років. Чому ми маємо в Україні робити меншу? Менший термін державної підтримки, хоча умови у нас економічні, політичні набагато гірші, ніж в країнах Європейського Союзу. Розмір квоти для вітрової електроенергії. Чому я пишу 40%? 40% це була перша цифра, яка узгоджувалась перед першим читанням законопроекту про введення зелених аукціонів. Я вам довів вже, що вітроенергетика при найменшій встановленій потужності, при найменших територіях найбільше виробляє електроенергії. Ну і період планування квот щорічно на 5 років, тому що менше просто інвестор не може розраховувати і планувати якісь великі проекти, якщо він не передбачає, що на найближчі 5 років будуть надані квоти для впровадження проєктів відновлення джерел енергії. Обов'язково участь аукціонів нові ВЕС, ми вважаємо, що менше, ніж 20 мегаватт взагалі не мають приймати участь в аукціонах, тобто вони можуть, якщо вони хочуть, але розвиток саме малої генерації, децентралізованої генерації, сьогодні весь світ стоїть на тому, що саме така генерація, вона більше розвивається, вона більше надає можливість збалансувати електромережу і не вплинути негативно на роботу електромереж. Ну, розвин банковської гарантії теж. От у нас тут багато було пропозицій, давайте зробимо 50 тисяч євро для участі. Справа в тому, що ми хочемо, щоб в цьому ринку працювали і селередні, і малий, і великий бізнес. Якщо ми зробимо велику більше, ніж 15 тисяч євро, а сьогодні зафіксована так ціна, ми просто можемо обмежити безпосередньо участі для середнього і малого бізнесу. Ну і далі, встановлено відповідальність. Ми все ж таки рік працювали над тим, як прорахувати введення відповідальності за небаланси. І вирішили, що це треба, має бути процес поступовий, і це прописано про закон про ринок електричної енергії. І я вважаю, що саме там, як прописано, треба і закладати в новий закон про зелені тарифи. Далі, стосовно зменження, ну, зменшення тарифів, ну, на 20% ще, і 10% є такі цифри, які домовились на ринку, серед гравців, але я вважаю, що подальше зменшення протягом трьох років, а особисто для вітроенергетики, хоч там і прописано півтора процента, а коли починаєш рахувати, виходить 1,9%, 2,5%, кожен рік воно нарощується. Тобто вітроенергетика вийде на достатньо низький тариф, і просто цей тариф не буде цікавим, вітроенергетика буде працювати як звичайна традиційна енергетика за звичайним тарифом. А далі, стосовно надбавки, да, ми написали до 15%. Насправді сьогодні кожна країна Європейського Союзу, хоч офіційно про це не говорить, вона захищає свій ринок. І не підтримувати нашого національного виробника в цьому, це було б некоректно. Причому це не обов'язкове виконання саме надбавки до українського обладнання. Це 
стимул для розвитку нашої національної виробництва і економіки. Ну і далі. ТУ для всіх вест діють три роки з можливістю пролонгації. Бо у нас часто виникає проблема, коли вже починає, закінчується будівництво вітростанції, виникають проблеми з електромережами, з підключенням, міняються правила гри. І іноді ці речі, вони не залежать від інвестора, не залежать, що ми зірвались роки, а залежать суто від технічних умов наших електромереж. Тобто треба передбачити на якихось інших умовах зробити пролонгацію. Це такі головні тези, але я хотів ще при кінці додати, по-перше, враховуючи нові директиви Європейського Союзу, я чув про те, що для децентралізованих, особисто для домашніх господарств, ні в кому і якому разі не можна зменшувати тарифну підтримку. Залишувати, залишати. У нас сьогодні в законі проговорюють зменшити там на 20-25%. Це неправильно. Саме домашні господарства в першу чергу мають бути підтримати. І по-друге, стосовно біомаси. У нас сьогодні знов таки говорять про балансуючі потужності. Я вважаю, що нам не просто треба зберегти зелений тарів для біомаси, а взагалі його підняти, прорахувати, скільки будуть коштувати саме потужності маневрові за рахунок виробництва біогазу, тобто біогаз для виробництва електрики і біомаси для електрики, це вирішить, а саме водень одна з технологій, які можуть вирішити проблему саме маневровних потужностей в Україні. Ну і я хочу закінчити, у нас майже завтра з'явиться огляд вітроенергетики України за 2018 рік на сайті українською мовою і через тиждень з'явиться англійською мовою і ви можете подивитися, детально прописан весь сектор вітрової енергетики в 2018 році, все законодавство і прогноз на наступні роки. Дуже дякую за увагу. Thank you, Mr. Konechenko, for a very interesting presentation from the side of the wind industry in Ukraine. Now, and I also want to thank all the last speakers because they accepted to have a little of time constraint. Actually, we have enough time to show the video of uh, Mr. Ferreira. They told me that it's uh, very short and uh, interesting, so if we can uh, streamline it, so we can uh, uh, learn about uh, the Brazilian experience, which is... Hi, good morning. I'm Rafael Ferreira. I'm the head of wholesale prices in the Brazilian market operator, and I'm very glad to be here talking to you about auctions. I'm sorry that I couldn't be in Kiev, uh, but I'm very glad that I received the invitation from the State Agency on Energy Efficiency and Energy Savings of Ukraine and from the International Renewable Energy Agency to record this 10-minute video to share some of the experiences and some of the, some of the lessons that Brazil has learned about auctions as ways of fostering renewable generation. Well, first let's take a look at some of the results that we have seen in Brazil in the last 15 years. Indeed, we have been using auctions since the early 2000s to, um, as the main mechanisms to ensure that new generation capacity comes online. And over those 15 years, we have seen more than 70 gigawatts of installed capacity of generation coming online as a result of the auctions. Auctions have been used for several technologies, uh, including thermal generation as well, but also for renewable generation with a great focus on wind and energy power ever since and wind and solar power ever since the 2009. Uh, basically, you see there in the graph some of the results of auctions since 2012 in Brazil. Uh, it is very clear that uh, wind and solar capacity account for a large share of the capacity, uh, total contracted capacity in the auctions. And we are, you also see a very steep, deep uh, decrease in the auction prices, the prices at which we contracted this uh, wind and solar capacity in 2018. Having said that, we can jump straight into the lessons that we learned from auctions in Brazil. Uh, given that we only have 10 minutes, we try to select some of the lessons that may be more related at, with the stage at which you are in, in the Ukraine right now, which is the issuing of primary legislation for the energy auctions. Well, the first lesson that we feel may be relevant to you is how we manage in Brazil to combine the legal stability provided by the primary uh, legislation on auctions 
with enough, enough flexibility to adapt the auction design to challenges that appear over time as the system evolves, as the complexity of the market evolves. And basically what we've done is to ensure that the primary legislation covers enough topics and enough, uh, enough uh, auction design elements to ensure that, first of all, you've got legal stability for the investors, and this is of course a requirement that they need in order to invest in the system, and also to provide them with a long-term view and to make, uh, give them enough information to uh, allow them to form reasonable long-term expectations on what would be the demand, what would be the market opportunities that they would see in the country if they participate in the auctions. So uh, our primary legislation, uh, legislation on auctions approaches items such as the objectives of the auctions, the goals that you have while making the auctions, and a high-level schedule for the auctions for the next years. Uh, we also cover in the primary legislation guidelines on which are the eligible sellers, the generators, the projects that will be selling energy via the contracts in the auctions, and the buyers, the consumers that will act as the buying counterparts of the contractual relationships. Uh, the primary legislation also covers some topics on mechanisms to ensure credit worthiness of the buyers mainly, but also some guarantees from the sellers. And it also has very general high-level guidelines on how to locate risks among the sellers and the buyers. And another very important topic covered in the primary legislation is the allocation of responsibilities between the power sector institutions that have a say on the auction design process. That is to say, how to locate responsibilities between the market operator, the energy ministry, the system operator, the planning agency. And uh, by doing this, by allowing that uh, those institutions cover items such as contract design, they cover items such as the bidding and the winner selection protocols, they cover actions, uh, cover items such as uh, remuneration mechanisms in the secondary legislation. We have ensured that the auctions are uh, legally stable and they are, the, the primary legislation is able to send those long-term signals to the potential participants in the auctions while keeping some design flexibility to, come, to face uh, challenges that come online as with time passes. And um, another important lesson that is related to, the, to this first one is how we actually allocate those technical responsibilities regarding the auction design process between those institutions that can issue the secondary legislation. And um, this is, has been very important in Brazil to ensure that this flexibility that we have in the auction design did not result in a perception of risks by potential auction participants. And uh, basically what we did is that we set a robust set of checks and balances, balances in the system using uh, two main pillars. First, we allocated, of course, the primary responsibility for the design of each, of each auction element be it contract design, be it uh, auction uh, bidding or winner selection protocols or uh, remuneration mechanisms to the institutions that are, best, that are best fit technically to deal with those and to make the best decisions possible. For instance, the Ministry of Mines and Energy has the attribution of establishing the auction guidelines. The regulator has the attribution of designing contracts the market operator has the attribution of designing the auction protocols in what concerns bidding and winner selection. The energy planning agency has the attribution of designing the qualification requirements for projects and so on. Another important element to make sure that you have this robust system of checks and balances is not only to allocate those responsibilities optimally, but also to create forums in which different uh, institutions, they can discuss each of the design choices, choices for the auctions. For instance, one very uh, relevant institution uh, forum that we have here in Brazil is the Special Commission for Energy Auctions, in which uh, the, each of those institutions that we've mentioned so far have a seat. For instance, the market operator has a representative there, the energy ministry has a representative there, and the energy planning agency and the regulator and so on. And those institutions serve as forums to discuss all of the choices that are made. And there are, there, they ensure that you have a due, due decision process 
to, to uh, when all of those decisions are coming in mind. For instance, what does this do process involve? First of all, there is the obligation that all of the decisions are based on analysis, on technical analysis, sound technical ana analysis. Uh, the regulator is obliged, for instance, to conduct regulatory impact assessments on the, the, the design of contracts. And second, you have public consultations uh, to before each of those decisions are made, and you make sure that you have transparency and the participation of the general public and of, poten and of potential investors when you are designing those rules. This results not only in transparency, but also on le the legitimacy of the rules that are passed. And finally, a third important lesson from the Brazilian experience with auctions is about some fundamental trade-offs in auction design that have to be made. Basically, I would say that there are three main dimensions in which you have the trade-offs, the first of which being whether you will rely more on comp competition as the sole mechanism to deliver good results in the auctions, that is to say, you will be more tilted towards a market-based mechanism or if you're going to embed the auctions with sufficient administrative guidance, with enough mechanisms for uh, the governmental institutions to guide the results of the auctions in order to make the best results possible. Another important dimension is simplicity of the auction rules and of the auction design in general versus the complexity of the auction rules and uh, the uh, auction design in general. Simplicity may be very important when you're holding the first auctions and uh, if you want to facilitate the participation of different players in the auctions, it also can help you communicate the results more easily of the, the auctions. But complexity may, may be necessary when the market complexity as a whole increases, and if you want to incorporate certain elements that are not, uh, are not immediately uh, in, in, uh, intrinsically incorporated in the auction results uh, when you're selecting your winners. Another important dimension in which you have trade-offs is whether you allocate the risks to the sellers, to the uh, generation projects that are selling energy in the auctions, or if you allocate them to buyers. Again, if you allocate them more to buyers, perhaps you're taking a little bit of risks out of the sellers and therefore increasing the interest uh, of participation in the auctions, but you might end up with not selecting the economically optimal projects if you look at the market signals alone. Well, it is very important that policymakers, they understand those three axes of uh, trade-offs and that they understand in which of the axes where they are in the spectrum of possible choices between each extreme of the spectrum. Um, let me give you an example. Here in Brazil, our first, first experiences with auctions, perhaps our design was a little bit more tilted than nowadays towards simplicity and towards allocating risks to buyers because we didn't have this much experience with auctions and per because there wasn't so much experience with auctions anywhere in the world so a more simple mechanism was thought to be appropriate to attract more uh, players uh, because we wanted to increase the interest uh, of, of different players in the auctions and increase participation so this is one of the choices that we made but as our market evolved I have seen the, the, the design of the auctions tilt a little bit more towards complexity. Indeed, the contracts are more complex nowadays. The mechanisms for risk allocation during the construction phase are more complex nowadays. And shifting a little bit more towards risk allocation to sellers. And uh, this is very important to illustrate that the, the fundamental choices, the fundamental trade-offs that you make when you're uh, designing auctions they shouldn't be written in stone in the sense that as the time passes and as the market evolves, you should change, change them from one auction to the other if you need to adapt to a particular challenge that comes online in your jurisdiction. Um, a very material example of this is what happened in Brazil with our disincentives to underbuilding, that is to say disincentives for delays in the delivery of the energy that was contracted via the auctions, these incentives to delay in the construction of projects, that they started more uh, relatively simple and with more risks allocated to the buyer, but as time passed and as we have seen several projects have uh, with delays in their implementation, we have established stricter 
qualification requirements, stricter penalties for delays, and we have also placed more risks on the seller. Well, those were the three options that I wanted to cover in those uh, 10 minutes, but I feel that it is important to note here in the end two things. First, we selected those three uh, lessons based on what we thought could be important for a jurisdiction that is now thinking about introducing the primary legislation in auctions, but there are several other items that we could approach and that we, we will be very glad to approach with you and discuss with you if you have the desire to. And the second important note is that, of course, we are talking about the Brazilian experience and the context of Brazil matters a lot, our economical, political, and social context. And of course, that it is very hard to immediately transfer one lesson from one country to, to the other. And this should be taken into account when you are interpreting the results and the solutions that were used in Brazil. Having said that, thank you very much for your attention. And we will be at your disposal if you want to discuss more about this very important topic. Thank you. Okay, this uh, concludes uh, our panel. I want to thank again all the presenters that uh, provide us very different point of views. And uh, so if you, want, if you want to give a last round of applause uh, to them uh, because of... No? Yeah, come on. And, uh, and, uh, and invite everybody for the workshop after the lunch that uh, will uh, start uh, not at 15, but at 15.15. 15, so we have a little more time for our lunch. Thank you.